Good morning. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, see some uh, similarly aged faces in the audience of people I trained with or was in uh, various uh, aspects of my past. Uh, this is the uh, first of two ultrasound lectures. You're going to get another one next month uh, from a different specialty, emergency medicine. And I think that it's uh, very interesting that many non radiologists are presenting talks on ultrasound. It shows the level of interest and in how valuable this technique is. So I don't have any disclosures. Uh, this talk is not to teach you how to read ultrasounds. Uh, if you see uh, ultrasound images, it's just to kind of make the slides a little bit more attractive. But I don't expect you to, uh, to pass a test on this later. Uh, just out of interest, this happens to be a parotid gland uh, ultrasound in uh, lower images in patients with uh, Sjogren syndrome. Uh, here are all the references that you need to read by tonight. Um, and if you're interested, these will be available online. There's really a lot being produced uh, as far as uh, literature on, on ultrasound in, in rheumatology. So it's actually about 15 years ago that I asked myself this question. Um, Pretty much as it's written here, since I'm an excellent rheumatologist with nearly 25 years of experience, and since I perform a careful, accurate physical exam, are you telling me that I would change my diagnoses and treatments uh, if I used ultrasound? Um, of course, anyone uh, embarking on a, a learning curve for ultrasound would have to ask themselves this because it takes quite a while to learn. And I will summarize really the next uh, three points, which is pretty much the entire talk. That over the past 16 years, musculoskeletal ultrasound use in rheumatology clinics and inpatient has unequivocally been shown to change diagnoses and treatment plans in at least 50% of the patients who are seen. And I've personally found this to be the case. Ultrasound guided joint and tendon injections are more accurate and have better outcomes than the regular landmark or anatomic guided injections. This is a cost effective technique. It's popular with patients. It helps the examiner or sonographer understand anatomy and disease processes more completely. And with proper training and experience, it is reliable and reproducible. Another question, it's a little bit less serious, um, but something that I was asked initially, um, you know, we're really gaming the system. Rheumatologists have been procedure poor, uh, all the history of rheumatology, and they're just looking for something to make money. Um, this is uh, absolutely not true. Musculoskeletal exams are a fraction of the cost of the MRIs. Reimbursement for musculoskeletal ultrasound exams is low uh, and decreasing, and I know that because I'm always being told that the number of RVUs I get credit for are inadequate. Um, but because a musculoskeletal ultrasound improves the quality of rheumatologist decisions, diagnoses, and treatments, uh, it's really worth doing. Uh, rheumatology fellows are now being trained and, uh, in ultrasound, and I believe that it's making them better rheumatologists. Okay, so what am I going to tell you about today? A little bit about the history of ultrasound in rheumatology, very brief. Uh, something about how its reliability and appropriate use have been evaluated and uh, clarified. And then I'm going to give you three examples, three different cases uh, that, that hopefully will be of interest to you. The first is rheumatology specific uh, with, uh, about rheumatoid arthritis. And although many of you in the audience, except for maybe five or six of you, and I see rheumatologists here, um, it may not be something that you deal with all the time. I think it's important for you to know what rheumatologists do uh, with ultrasound in rheumatoid arthritis patients. 
The second is a much more uh, applicable to anyone who does primary care, and that's how to deal with shoulder pain. And I will spend some time about the values of ultrasound in this problem. And lastly, and probably the reason that this talk was given or, or chosen, was uh, that we are developing a giant cell arteritis fast track clinic here. And I'll tell you about that uh, in the evaluation and early treatment of uh, patients who have GCA or are suspected of having GCA. That, by the way, the pictures here, this is a power Doppler image of a MCP joint in someone who has very active synovitis. Uh, and then this down here is a picture of an enthesitis at the distal end of the patellar tendon where it attaches to the bone. That's it. You don't have to look at any more of these images. Uh, there were first published uh, descriptions of ultrasound in normal and abnormal musculoskeletal tissues uh, back in 1958. Not too much happened until a Baker cyst was, was seen in 1972. Um, and then color and power Doppler uh, was developed uh, and uh, analyzed and found to be very uh, clearly uh, indicative of active synovitis. International training programs began in 1998 through our sister organization in Europe. Uh, that ULAR is European League Against Rheumatism. Um, that, that, that's really what it's still called. And uh, it corresponds to our American College of Rheumatology. Um, and they, in Europe, really uh, exceeded and uh, preceded our knowledge of musculoskeletal ultrasound by a good 10 to 15 years. Uh, Technology has improved, as has been the case with all computer-assisted uh, devices uh, through the 1990s to the present. Uh, the machines are now portable and less expensive. Um, even though they're less expensive, that doesn't mean that I have a new machine because I'm at the, the university. Um, I purchased my first ultrasound machine that was supposed to generate some laughter. Um, I purchased my first ultrasound machine in 2003 and took a course from AIUM, I'm sure you don't know what that is, it's the American Institute of Ultrasound in Medicine, it's a group of radiologists, uh, and took a course in New York City. I was so um, excited about what, what I saw um, that it really changed my approach. Uh, I thought, gee, th this is really something. For all these years, I've been seeing the top of the iceberg, and now I can see down beneath the skin and see what's really going on in these joints. Uh, there were two rheumatologists in the state of Washington who got interested in this at the same time, and we kind of self-taught each other and had uh, monthly evening get-togethers, and um, in 2007, uh, Gurjit and I went to Europe. It was really a rough, rough go. We went to Barcelona and had to stay out on the beach and take this course, but uh, we passed. Um, and uh, that was an advanced course in musculoskeletal ultrasound, and uh, a year later, he and I and a small group founded an organization called U.S. Sonar. Um, this is a, a nonprofit uh, teaching uh, group, which has uh, subsequently been able to, to teach uh, rheumatology fellows and faculty uh, to the, with the goal of increasing the number of faculty who are knowledgeable and can teach fellows. Certification in uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound began in 2012 with this organization. Um, if you could take away anything from today, it's going to be what a lot of initials mean. Uh, ARDMS uh, is a, a group that certifies many specialties in medicine, um, in uh, uh, physician groups, cardiology, vascular ultrasound, general ultrasound. Uh, and I 
and got my certification the first year in 2012. Another reflection of the popularity of ultrasound and rheumatology, total number of publications in PubMed. I have gone from seven uh, in the early 90s up to over a thousand last year. Um, and, and also at our annual American College of Rheumatology meeting, uh, they have al also paralleled this increase in interest. Um, since that time, I'm not going to go year by year, but, but give you kind of an overview. Because of these improved technologies and power Doppler, a lot more image uh, accuracy and image quality has resulted. An, a European organization, AMARAC, which uh, is a um, outcome measure in rheumatology committee, uh, they have a subdivision in, in ultrasound. They have put together large cooperative multi-center studies in ultrasound that improve the reliability, standardization, and reproducibility of these techniques in trained individuals. U.S. sonar, as I mentioned, and certification have been developed. American College of Rheumatology in 2013 began a certification exam as well. The purpose of certification uh, was to uh, prevent the third party payers from perhaps saying that rheumatologists were not capable of doing a, a, uh, an exam and therefore not paying us. So certification was a way of uh, trying to assure outside organizations that uh, we were trained properly. I'm going to move on to um, appropriate use of, of this technique, and I've listed three major publications. Uh, the first one's a textbook, which came out by a European group, uh, the use of musculoskeletal ultrasound, and then two uh, publications uh, in, in the United States, uh, one in 2012 and one in 2014, if you can see those dates, uh, about the, the proper use of this technique. Now, in Florida, about 10 years ago, the podiatrists uh, were restricted from using ultrasound in their practice, and third-party payers stopped paying them. And the reason given was that they were doing this on every patient who walked in the door. Uh, I'm not bad-mouthing podiatry, but I'm just saying there's been a balance between appropriate use uh, that is clearly beneficial uh, and excessive use uh, just to pad the bill. Um, Medicare and other third-party payers have taken care of that by paying so little for each exam. Um, so the first level A evidence uh, that everyone agrees to is that it's reasonable to use musculoskeletal ultrasound to guide articular and periarticular aspirations or injections at a variety of sites. And these are joints, tendons, around joints, and around tendons. And the reason for this is that injections are more accurate in all these different joints, and I'm not going to go through all of the data. They are, uh, have been shown to have improved outcome uh, and are less painful. There are also a series of joints that I never thought I would ever inject because they were so far away or had so many other structures around them. Hips are the, are the main place that none of us really inject. We would always send patients to radiology to have a fluoroscopic or now CT guided injection. But ultrasound has been shown to be just as accurate, quite a bit easier. It's an outpatient procedure. It's done really within 10 minutes. And this is an example of a femoral head, acetabulum, the femoral neck, and this would be the direction of the needle. Uh, Baker's cysts can be seen easily in aspirated uh, shoulder ganglia or other shoulder exams, which I'll show you. Meniscal cysts, this happens to be a meniscus with a cleft down the middle and a cyst here with, that is fluid filled. We do uh, percutaneous tenotomies, so uh, a traumatizing chronically inflamed tendons so that they heal better. Um, 
calcific tendonitis of the shoulder, barbitage, which I, I may go into later, later, and carpal tunnel injection. And this is a picture cross-section of the median nerve. Um, this is the retinaculum, and here's a needle coming in right under the nerve. This is done very easily in the clinic, and the outcomes are better than blind or, or uh, anatomic uh, um, related injections. A couple other slides on reasonable use. Uh, to clarify the diagnosis of a painful joint or a swollen joint in all of these joints, uh, this has been shown to be the case that ultrasound is better. To evaluate for tendon, joint, or emphysis inflammation, the use of power Doppler, looking for erosions and effusions, much more accurate than clinical exam. Um, evaluating pain that seems to be around the joints, this is very valuable and I'll mention this briefly later. People who have central pain disorders trying to help figure out whether the pain is articular or whether it's coming from some neurologic uh, source. Um, we also use this to monitor disease activity in inflammatory conditions. We also use it, as I showed before, for entrapment neuropathies, injections around nerves, and the three most common are median, ulnar, and posterior, posterior tibial nerves. Uh, this is re relatively easy to do. Of course, anesthesia does this all the time with nerve blocks, and basically we're doing a nerve block. A rheumatologist is doing a nerve block. Um, and then also for evaluation and injection of joints in uh, oversized individuals. These may be people who are very muscular or people who, where you can't really find an anatomic place. You don't really know where the knee is or where the patella is. Okay, so just one practical example before I go on to the cases. Why is this ankle swollen? So one of the first cases that I saw probably 15 years ago, a referral from an ID doctor, an associate of mine, in a lupus patient who had a fever and a swollen ankle that looked inflamed. It was red and warm and she had a fever. And he said, can you aspirate this ankle and tell me whether she has a septic joint or not? And I can tell you that I looked and there was no effusion in the joint, but she had cellulitis and I could diagnose that. So you can't tell what a swollen ankle is due to. It could be due to fluid in the tibio-talar joint, the true ankle. Uh, it could be due to, uh, this, is power, this is a color Doppler around a large tendon. I think it's a posterior tibial tendon and fluid. So this is a tenosynovitis. It could be acute gout. This happens to be a um, double contour sign, which indicates the likelihood that the urate is coating the surface of the uh, cartilage. Uh, or it could be cellulitis, and this is actually what cellulitis looks like. The fat globules are surrounded by dilated lymphatics. Uh, and so ultrasound can be very helpful in something like a painful swollen ankle. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to these. Um, I don't have a, a watch here, so I wanna make sure I stay in time. Um, so the first, first case uh, I'll tell you about is a patient with rheumatoid arthritis. This is a very, very common problem in rheumatology, and uh, I'll use this case to, um, to inform you about how, how we utilize ultrasound. The next, shoulder pain, which I've told you about. And then lastly, this giant cell arteritis rapid evaluation with vascular ultrasound. Okay. Clinical remission is now something that rheumatologists shoot for in our RA patients, something we didn't think of 15 years ago, but now it's our goal. So low disease activity or clinical remission. And the question is, has arisen nationally and internationally is how do you define clinical remission? How, how can you really tell that a patient with RA who feels good does not have subtle inflammation that will damage his or her joints over the next five to 10 years. 
Uh, and there are a series of clinical uh, methods, which I'm not going to go over, but they include uh, two. I've got two named uh, um, activity indices here, CDI and DAS28, which are clinical methods for trying to assess disease activity. So this woman, a 45-year-old woman with a five-month history of RA, came in with lots of inflammatory joints. They're mainly symmetrical and small joints. She was positive serologically, both rheumatoid factor and high titer anti-CCP. Her foot and hand x-rays were normal, and she had these two scores, which indicate moderate disease activity. She was started on a standard regimen with an anti-inflammatory drug, hydroxychloroquine and methotrexate. The methotrexate dose was increased after uh, four weeks uh, when, uh, when she didn't respond adequately. Uh, and the goal was what is now called treat the target, just like you do with uh, hypertension and diabetes. Our target is low disease activity or complete remission. And so she was evaluated frequently and attempt to make the CDI drop and the DAS drop. And sure enough, they did. After four months of this treatment, she was felt to be in clinical remission. She felt good. She felt that her treatment regimen was great. And she was not at all interested in any medication change. Luckily, her rheumatologist, one of the people sitting in this audience uh, was smart enough to say, okay, well, this is very good, but let's do an ultrasound and look for, uh, what, see whether you have any subtle synovitis. And if you do, we might make a change. And if you don't, then we're good. And so an ultrasound exam was performed, and this is a, an abbreviated exam that's done. We don't do all 78 or 62 joints. We do about 12 joints and bilateral exam listed here. And what do you know? She had uh, on one on a couple of her MCP joints a large effusion and color Doppler. And this was the position of the probe. Uh, so in her MCP, she had active inflammation, and at her wrist. She also had fluid in the dorsal recesses, uh, synovial hypertrophy, which you can see here, it's kind of this gray area, and both uh, color and power Doppler. Uh, two different machines, that's why it looks different. So she had persistent inflammation documented, two plus power Doppler considered significant. These findings don't match or didn't match with her clinical uh, symptoms and clinical exam. Um, she, but she's not in what would be called imaging remission. She has persistent disease activity. And if you look at patients with persistent disease activity, they are the ones who have flares in their rheumatoid arthritis in the next one to two years. Half of RA patients in clinical remission will have flares, and it turns out that each of them uh, most likely has power Doppler. Um, the criteria by the American College of Rheumatology and ULAR um, for remission do not predict flares. However, the use of power Doppler has a very high negative predictive value. So if that exam shows no power Doppler, the likelihood that that person will get a clinical a flare in their RA in the next year is very low. And in fact, if both the clinical criteria and the power Doppler are negative, the chance of a flare is almost zero. So power Doppler activity is the most accurate determinant of future flare. So it's a very important determinant in how, how the rheumatologist would adjust therapy. I'm not gonna read all of this, but this is an article uh, from 2014 evaluating the impact of musculoskeletal ultrasound on uh, these patients. And it's important to know that a little bit less than a third of patients who are evaluated have, uh, in this situation, uh, have their treatment changed. 25% uh, in low disease activity or clinical remission have their uh, medications increased. 
but 67% don't. So that means that most of the time, and two thirds of the time, patients who are in clinical remission do not need their medications changed, but a significant portion of them do. Okay, so this was explained to the patient. It was explained to her that she was likely to have a flare, that this predicted future erosions, disability, and indicated the need to add a biologic agent. So uh, she agreed, um, as you might imagine, a TNF blocker, I'm not mentioning the name because we don't wanna uh, foster the use of any product. Um, methotrexate was continued, repeat ultrasound exam was normal without any evidence of inflammation or power Doppler. But one year later, she came back, she had some routine visits in between, but one year later, she came back complaining of pain all over, poor sleep, and she was absolutely certain that her RA had flared. So a repeat ultrasound exam was requested by her very astute rheumatologist, whose name I won't mention, and it was normal. And so she was told that most likely she had fibromyalgia. She had a central pain disorder that was triggered by some other life event and that her medication didn't need to be changed. So both on the positive side and on the negative side, ultrasound can be very helpful. So patients on DMARDs, the disease-modifying agents, in clinical remission or low disease activity, the presence of power Doppler on exams strongly suggests the need for additional medications. And the absence, on the flip side, in these patients would predict stable disease, which does not require any medication change. So that's RA. Now, for those of you who see Patient, patients who have shoulder pain. This is probably the third most common cause of uh, painful joints coming to primary care physicians. And I'm gonna to talk to you about what I feel and many feel is the best triage method for determining the cause. So a 45 year old man presents with right shoulder pain with use and at rest. There's no history of trauma. He's been doing some overhead work under his car, just like many of you in this room. Uh, two months of right shoulder pain, and he's had reduced range of motion, pain with reaching, and it's affecting his sleep. And uh, this is gonna be pretty condensed here. So on exam, he has some tenderness uh, anteriorly and laterally. He has reduced abduction. For those of you who've forgotten what abduction is, it's this, uh, and impingement. So, um, and there are a whole bunch of maneuvers to, to measure this, and I'm not gonna go through that, but he has no weakness. So the examining doctor doesn't think he has a large, massive tear, but thinks there's something going on in there that isn't right. Uh, the x-rays are normal, uh, so there's, this is a very common situation. And so now, what should you do? Do you send him to physical therapy for at least a month or two months? Do you perform a subacrobial injection just because he's there and he's complaining of pain? Do you refer him to orthopedics, knowing that they will do an injection and get an MRI? Or do you send him for musculoskeletal ultrasound? Uh, I, I'm actually not asking for business here, um, but uh, I'm just listing the, the choices. Okay, out of uh, just being cost conscious, a physical therapy for a month generally costs about $1,500, believe it or not. A subacromial injection, about $150. Referral to orthopedics, of, of course, depends on what they do. There's a consult, an injection, and possibly a, an MRI. And uh, a musculoskeletal ultrasound exam and injection may be somewhere around $200. So which approach is the most cost effective while revealing an accurate diagnosis and treatment plan in the shortest time? And of course, why else would I put this up here? 
except to uh, toot my own horn. Um, it, it really is the quickest way to get at the cause and to decide on an appropriate treatment. So as a screening technique, it's very effective. I'm gonna present some data from three radiology groups, not from rheumatology groups. And this is a systematic review and meta-analysis um, in a journal that all of you I'm sure are familiar with, Archives of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. There are a number of seven important points brought out in this review article. Physical exam for shoulder pain is fraught with uncertainty. No matter how good an exam you do, even assuming that all of you in this room are very skilled, which may not be true, um, it's fraught with uncertainty. Uh, it's generally found to be uh, fairly inaccurate for making the correct diagnosis. Full thickness rotator cuff tears should be referred to orthopedics, but other conditions do not require a surgeon. Ultrasound exam has a high diagnostic accuracy for full thickness tears of the rotator cuff, and the likelihood ratio is very, very high, so it's positive predictive value and negative predictive value is excellent. It offers similar performance to MRI and MRI arthrography for full thickness tears, both having very, very similar sensitivity and specificity. And interestingly, partial thickness tears are more accurately found with ultrasound. Uh, they generally require conservative therapy, non-surgical care, uh, and can be more readily diagnosed with ultrasound. Uh, MRI arthrogram, on the other hand, will be very accurate, perhaps a little bit more accurate than ultrasound. Uh, and ultrasound enables a physician to rule in or rule out full thickness tears, allows rapid identification for surgical candidates. Performing ultrasound as a screening test will save healthcare dollars because of the differential in cost. Okay, another reference in the Journal of Ultrasound and Medicine from uh, Washington University, and I'll quote this, a musculoskeletal ultrasound is an established validated diagnostic imaging modality for the evaluation of clinically suspected rotator cuff disorders. In concordance with recent increased use, this study finds that musculoskeletal ultrasound of the shoulder has a substantial impact on patient treatment and decision-making of clinicians. And what they did was they, they had uh, orthopedists, um, sports medicine doctors, evaluate patients before and after ultrasound. Uh, Post-ultrasound treatment decisions were made and pre ultrasound treatment decisions were made. And in over 50% of the patients, the treatment decision was changed from just the clinical exam. And the blue bars are post shoulder ultrasound treatment plan and the red, whatever, orange uh, are pre. And so most of the patients, as in probably most of your practices, get sent to physical therapy. Um, and that's just what almost all of us have done. It's quite expensive, uh, and once an ultrasound was done, it was decided in more than half of them to do something different. And uh, the, the, sh the choices are shown here. It really depends on what, what population you're looking at, uh, how many patients are referred for surgery. So younger patients, Older patients look very different uh, in their, these numbers. So this is an overview just telling you how important it is. But depending on the age group uh, of, the, of the study, it may find many more who go to surgery because of rotator cuff tears in an older age group. Okay. So now this was uh, uh, a capitated healthcare system study which of course, you know, we look at with 
certain, certain value. Um, and they tried to reduce the number of what they called unnecessary shoulder MRI exams within this capitated system. Uh, and they are proposing shoulder ultrasound as a preferred method. Immediately, of course, everyone is questioning the results here. Um, but they found that approximately 45% of the shoulder MRI exam, uh, exams were ordered inappropriately based on established criteria, most commonly due to the absence of a preceding x-ray. Based on clinical and radiographic criteria, ultrasound would be indicated as a cost-effective substitution in two-thirds of the MRI orders. And the combination of an ultrasound and a radiograph would accurately diagnose the problem in 85% of all shoulder pathologies present in those cases. So MRI is a great technique, MRI uh, arthrogram, but really is needed in a minority of patients, at least in this study. And they have a little uh, diagram here, which I find really quite helpful. And they, they were able, if you have concern clinically for a tumor or acute pain or trauma in a person under the age of 40, you must get a radiograph. But if it's not these things, and if they have the inability, uh, instability, or there's a potential history of dislocation or labral pathology, if that isn't present, then do ultrasound. So if you can eliminate these three areas, then the ultrasound is the way to go. Obviously, MRI or MRI arthrogram, if you're going to go to surgery, most surgeons still don't accept ultrasound exam findings to do surgery. Uh, but there are institutions where that advance has taken place. Um, and ultrasound uh, does tell you which way to go. Okay, so back to our patient. You may have forgotten about the patient. This was the the guy who had two, two or three months of shoulder pain and had a normal x-ray. So on an ultrasound exam with the, with the transducer in front of the shoulder, we see a cross section of the biceps tendon. Uh, you see a ligamentous structure over the biceps tendon, fluid around the biceps tendon, and fluid in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. In addition, uh, on an image of the supraspinatus tendon, which is here, there's this very large linear calcification in, within the supraspinatus tendon. An erosion or a cortical defect, as it's called, and an articular surface defect in the tendon. So this was called subacromial subdeltoid bursitis, calcific supraspinatus tendonitis, and partial tear on the articular surface. Now, so we know what the person has. They don't have a complete tear. They don't need a referral to an orthopedist at this stage. So a steroid injection was performed. And if the patient improved, which is likely in about 80% of patients, that would be it. If the patient does not respond to this, they would begin physical therapy. And if physical therapy is not helpful or causes more pain, they would return for what's called barbitage, which is a flushing out of the calcium. Uh, it's done in the office. It takes about by me or by someone else that takes about 15 minutes, actually flush out the calcium with a large needle. There's no need for an MRI or an orthopedic consult at this stage because they're not going to do anything differently. They're not going to operate. And here's an injection. Uh, here's the, um, this isn't for real, but it's for show. Here's the, here's the needle. This is the supraspinatus tendon, the bone, 
and this is the bursa, this darker area here. And these are repetitive reflections of the needle. And a little video clip showing the needle going in and injecting. You can see the, the steroid and a little bit of air going in there. Okay, in summary, this is another algorithm. This is actually a society of radiologists, a consensus conference on how to approach shoulder pain. Uh, this is um, something that's a little complicated, so I, I'm using this as a summary slide. But if you have a patient who has a suspect rotator cuff pathology with shoulder pain, uh, this is a very nice method for using. So if it's a younger patient with trauma, the first step is getting an x-ray. If that is positive for a few things, then this may lead to uh, an MRI or an orthopedic consult. If it's negative, an ultrasound is the next reasonable test. If this is positive, it will show many different potential pathologies that can then go on to an MRI or orthopedic referral. And, and this is what uh, I have found to be very effective. Uh, shoulder ultrasound is complicated to learn, but once it's learned, it is extremely accurate uh, and can be extremely helpful. Treatment can be given at the same time um, and appropriate referral made. Okay. There's a, uh, a real emergency in rheumatology, and that is a patient who you think has giant cell arteritis. So this is uh, unfortunately something that is, uh, this, this disorder is the most common of the vasculitides. Uh, it is something that is um, more prevalent in the Scandinavian population. Uh, so in Northern Europe, and we see quite a bit of it here. Um, and so this, uh, the next section or the last section of the talk is directed to rapid diagnosis of this condition in a suspect population. So this is a pretty classic patient I'm just going to present as an example. So she has no prior uh, medical history. She's 75. But she does have a two-week history of some morning stiffness, difficulty getting out of bed. She has fatigue and malaise. This has started rather rapidly. She has a persistent left-sided headache, which is new for her, not a headache person. She has some right arm aching when she tries to play tennis. Obviously, she's not in Seattle uh, in, uh, in October. Um, she has a tender left temporal artery. Um, and a brewery over the right subclavian, and her blood pressure in her right arm is reduced. Now, the, you're rarely going to see all this. Uh, this is a make-believe case, and I've put in all the clinical clues that you could possibly ask for. Uh, many times, this is not the case. Her hematocrit is down. Her sed rate and CRP are very high. So, the diagnosis right away in the office, whether it's a GP, a sports medicine doctor, an internist, uh, hopefully they are worried about both PMR, polymyalgia rheumatica, and giant cell arteritis. Okay, uh, this talk is about GCA. So we make the diagnosis or consider it in patients who are over the age of 50 who complain of or found to have the following, pretty much everything she has, new onset headaches, an abrupt onset of visual disturbance, which usually is transient to begin with, and you've got to ask for this, and the transient may proceed permanent. This is what we want to avoid, visual loss. Symptoms of polymyalgia rheumatica, jaw, tongue, or extremity claudication, unexplained fever or anemia, and high inflammatory markers. 
classic presentation. Okay. So the usual approach is that you try to get a temporal artery biopsy within a week. You start steroids immediately. The yield decreases after a week of waiting, uh, after a week of steroids. But still, you should get a biopsy even up to a month later. A positive can be very helpful. However, the sensitivity is only 10 to 14%, depending on the series, the population you're looking at. Negative biopsy, unfortunately, does not totally rule out giant cell arteritis. And sometimes, if the clinical syndrome is extremely um, telling and you have a high clinical suspicion, steroids are used anyway. Now, biopsy negative GCA exists. Biopsy negative, meaning you didn't find the inflamed artery, or in the smaller subgroup of GCA, the temporal artery may not be involved. Uh, great vessels may be involved, not the temporal artery. So the carotid, the subclavian, the axillary artery. Sometimes we then have to treat with a negative biopsy and a likely syndrome. If the symptoms resolve within a week, we kind of uh, feel that we've been reassured that the person has GCA and end up treating them with high dose steroids uh, for a year or two. And you can imagine how uncomfortable that is uh, for the physician. I think that's why all of you send these patients to rheumatologists. You don't want uh, to have the responsibility for poisoning people with high-dose prednisone uh, like we, we really enjoy doing that. So the epidemiology, this is a group of patients. They're almost exclusively over 50 with a peak age of 70 to 80. A GCA, as I mentioned, is the most common type of systemic vasculitis. It is associated with PMR, our polymyalgia rheumatica, although PMR is two to three times more common. Women are affected two to three times more often than men. This is a disorder that is more common in Northern European or Scandinavian individu uh, individuals. So the prevalence in Norway is estimated at 37 patients per 100,000. Seven in Italy, uh, Northern Africa, countries three out of 100,000. Uh, PMR is present in 40 to 50% of GCA patients, so they are commonly associated. And in 20 to 30% of PMR patients that just have PMR, they actually have GCA. Uh, this may be seen on ultrasound exam, in big series where ultrasound exam or PET-CT was done on all patients with PMR, there was uptake in the arteries in 20 to 30% of the patients. Now, not all of those patients go on to have blindness, uh, but some of them do. PMR relaps that relapses when you taper the prednisone, that's the group that should be evaluated for possible GCA. So what's the risk in Seattle or in the state of Washington? There aren't any figures available, but I've done a little kind of gerrymandering of the, uh, of the statistics. So in Minnesota, there's a 20 per 100,000. In England, there's 22 per 100,000. These are prevalence rates. And I'm estimating, because of our population, somewhere between 15 to 18 per 100,000 in the state of Washington. In the greater Seattle area, which actually has 3.8 million people, I would estimate per year that we're gonna have 600 to 700 patients with GCA. And that means if we have 30% vision loss in these patients, now it's not permanent, but it may be transient plus permanent of 30%, then we may have as many as 200 patients per year in the state or in the, in the greater Seattle area, rather, uh, who have vision loss from GCA. So it's a 
significant number of people, uh, but I would imagine that all of you don't see that many. So the goal of treatment is to prevent vision loss. And this is what we really want to do. Once somebody loses vision completely, there is a 4% chance of regaining vision, uh, obviously minimal. And what we really, uh, and, and this is caused by anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, that's the most common cause, but there are other vessels that can cause this. And once one eye is involved, bilateral vision loss occurs, unfortunately, quite commonly. If timely therapy is given, it's only about a 13% chance of bilateral. But if timely therapy with prednisone or immunosuppressives is not given, is up to a 50% likelihood of bilateral permanent total vision loss because of infarction of the retina. This fixed blindness is frequently preceded by amaurosis, fugax, blurring, or diplopia, symptoms that you really need to pay attention to. Vision loss is very rare after four weeks of high dose, 40 to 60 milligrams of prednisone a day. Vision loss may occur in that, this 15 to 35% of patients, and it usually presents vision loss before they come to treatment. So there is the delay before they get to physicians that is really critical. And this, like used to be the case with MIs and with, um, with strokes, is what we have to have to work on. We have to make the diagnosis early. As, as with individuals who are having uh, myocardial infarctions and strokes, uh, obviously we're dealing with a much smaller population here at risk, um, but we need educational programs. This is one of them to this group. We need MDs and the public aware of the risks, must recognize the possible presentations for GCA, and make referrals and begin corticosteroids as soon as possible. And that's what I'm pushing in the next couple slides. Because once vision is impaired, it's really all over. It's all over for that eye or for both eyes. And that is not good. There is some European attempts going on in England, Norway, and Germany over the last probably five years to uh, make an impact on this, and they have, and they've begun what they call fast track clinics. And we are initiating an early diagnosis and treatment approach here as well. And it has the very catchy name of the UWGCA fast track clinic. Um, uh, in three areas, and I have press releases on two of them in Europe both in England and in Norway, there have been papers written about their experience. And the important bottom line is that in England, the irreversible sight loss from GCA, in, after instituting this and advertising uh, this um, approach, sight loss was decreased from 37% of patients with GCA down to 9%, and in Norway, even less. Uh, this is from a small town in Norway, and so I imagine that the advertisement was even um, more effective. The other thing that uh, they found in Norway was that there was a decrease in cost and hospital days uh, with early diagnosis and treatment. The same author, uh, Andreas, Diamantopoulos, should be very impressed I practiced that name, um, uh, presented a paper uh, which shows the significance of ultrasound in making an early diagnosis. Um, and he found in his large group of patients that the combination of temporal artery, axillary artery, and common carotid artery ultrasound was had a sensitivity of 100% in the diagnosis of GCA. Something called a halo sign, which I'll show you, it's a very sensitive marker 
of GCA. And color Doppler ultrasound has a better sensitivity and comparable specificity to biopsy. This is what it looks like. Uh, this happens to be color Doppler and the blue uh, is the flow in, in one direction or another, it, that doesn't matter. This is an artery. The wall, the, the, what looks black here, which is actually sort of an off black, has a little gray in it, uh, is a much thickened vascular wall. You see it in the long axis and a short axis. And then what is called a compression sign. These are very scientifically uh, accurate. You just kind of push on the transducer to eliminate the pulse. And what you see is the residual shadow of the wall. And the combination of these two signs is very helpful. Here you can see in an axillary artery, a very thickened um, intima media. Um, and, and this measurement, we have accurate um, lists of the normal cutoffs, which I'm not gonna show you. This is an axillary artery. And this is a, a transverse image uh, showing the thickened uh, edematous wall. It's a very high predictive value. And very interesting, this is a study out of Germany. This was a pre-treatment transverse section, and this is a post-treatment. Okay, so our goals are to educate the public as well as physicians to begin the therapy as quickly as possible by reducing the time from the PCP to uh, calling the rheumatologist, to see the patient within one to two days of referral, give them telephone advice uh, to initiate corticosteroids, uh, arrange at that phone call a temporal artery biopsy and the vascular ultrasound. We are doing this in cooperation with our vascular ultrasonography people and then see the patient within one to two days comparing the results and planning treatment. This is an algorithm uh, which has been uh, uh, developed by the British Society of Rheumatology. It basically shows that GCA is confirmed in their eyes when there's high clinical probability and a positive ultrasound and no biopsy is needed. Or in the opposite, when there's a low clinical probability and the ultrasound is negative. So one of the goals of this is to reduce the need for temporal artery biopsies, although they will be done in concert with the, with the ultrasound initially till we get uh, more experience. So this is our magic phone number. Uh, this is the process that we'll go through. And I think I'm running out of time, so I'll give you the key points. So it's the most common cause of vasculitis. Patients with PMR really may have giant cell arteritis or large vessel vasculitis. If the PMR relapses, they should be looked at carefully for GCA. The only way to prevent blindness is early suspicion and onset of treatment. And GCA fact, fast track clinics will hopefully lower the risk of vision loss and provide early diagnosis rapid initiation of treatment, and public and physician education programs. We plan to go around the greater Seattle area giving talks. Okay, summary slide. The use and range of applications of ultrasound continues to increase and evolve. Uh, this has been facilitated by improvement in technology, standardization, and education. And new techniques offer even more exciting possibilities for future disease management. Uh, an assessment I have not mentioned about Sjogren's syndrome, but there are a number of other uses. MSK ultrasound has allowed better informed decision making, improving both clinician and patient satisfaction and outcomes. And it is likely that as evidence of its value increases and it's incorporated into disease management and gui diagnosis guidelines, that MSK will, uh, ultrasound will be required as part of training in rheumatology nationally. And I've given these three examples as just um, a few of the practical use of ultrasound. Thank you.